Welcome to Unscripted with Russo. I'm your host, Ashley Russo, president and executive producer of The Peak TV. For our podcast, we decided to explore the people behind the narratives. I'll introduce decision makers and influencers who are winners in their field and find out the intimate story behind their rise to success. All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Unscripted with Russo. I have a great guest today, my good friend, Don Cunningham. He's the president and CEO of Lehigh Valley Economic Development Corp., which sounds it's very a official. That's a lot to say. It's a lot it to really say. Is. It is. Yeah, LVEDC yeah. kind of yeah. rolls off the tongue. It does. But for those yeah. who may not know that acronym, yeah. um, you guys do a lot in this area. Tell me just a little bit about the LVEDC. Well, so it is a mouthful to say. You know, it was started by the corporate leaders in the Lehigh Valley back in the mid-90s with a lot of, I think, vision and foresight. At that time in the mid-90s, the economy was very different here. Yeah, uh, Steel just closed. Well, yeah, it was, it was just closing. Right, closing. So things and, were changing pretty rapidly. You know, we're still feeling the effects of the Billy Joel song, Allentown, yeah. and the branding of the region wasn't real good. And it was a time when, you know, heavy industry in America was going down and it was kind of the Rust Belt story. And basically they said, look, we need to do two things. We need to act as a region. We need to rebrand ourselves as a region. Not just, because we'll never, Allentown, Bethlehem, and Easton will never have enough resources mm. to market themselves. So we can create a public-private partnership with corporate money and government money and um, tell the story of the region and try to rebuild the economy. So, you know, now 20 plus years ahead, um, it really looks very visionary because the region has transformed incredibly from the it economy is, of the mid-90s. It is amazing. I mean, we yeah. were just, uh, you know, lucky enough to be at your annual meeting, and I couldn't believe some of the statistics and data that you guys have pulled about how this region has changed and where it's going. Yeah. Um, I think the thing that struck me, and probably because I have a lot of millennials on my team, was the 44% of the workforce here are millennials, which I think is awesome. Like we're retaining this super dynamic yeah. group of young people to stay in this area, which I don't know that the Lehigh Valley has always been known for um, a big group of young people living here. <laughs> it's amazing because as the, the father of three millennials and the stepfather of one, I've spent most of my life trying to get them out of the house yeah. and moving away. <laughs> and then at work, I spent all this time trying to get them back. <laughs> So, no, but uh, yeah, it's amazing. 44% of the Lehigh Valley workforce, and actually as a percentage of the population in our cities, uh, Bethlehem and Easton, 30% uh, of the population is 18 to 34-year-olds, which is higher than the city of Philadelphia. That's amazing. Uh, Pennsylvania That's amazing. is 22%. I mean, for people yeah. to think about that, yeah. higher than the city of Philadelphia. So we always think young people go to the cities. Yeah. It does. It would explain a lot to me why there's such a cool vibe in our cities right now you know there's, there's a lot of places to go eat a lot of happy hours a lot of music yeah um it, i guess it's a know, great they when drive we, that when we kind of stumbled upon those stats we said wow we've got something really working here and allentown's not far off allentown's about 28 percent so uh lehigh valley and cities in general are running at the same pace as philadelphia that's awesome and well ahead of where pennsylvania is as a state at 22 percent. all right well before you became the ceo and president of the lehigh valley economic development corp yeah. which again sounds so <laughs> wonderful first of all we want to welcome you a little oh, pinot thanks. noir here yeah. unscripted this is definitely Just like kathy lee, lee and Hoda. Hoda. we yeah, thank them right, for the inspiration thanks, yeah. you are a lehigh valley yeah. boy yeah. So tell me a little bit about little Donnie Cunningham. Where <laughs> were you born and name. raised? Yeah. I had a feeling my you might have gone yeah, by a Donnie. I'm married to a Joey, so yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I always know when somebody says Donnie, it's, it's either family or people I grew up with. Yeah. Because say, hey, Donnie. You know, so, yeah, born and raised Bethlehem. My dad was a steel worker. You know, really have not been out of Bethlehem much. I uh, spent some time in Philadelphia, went to graduate school at Villanova, um, but otherwise, um, How many kids a total in your hometown. Family? So my immediate family is only two. Okay. I just have one sister. My dad's one of six, and the Cunningham family was a, a large family in general. All lived in the west side of Bethlehem, basically between 6th Avenue and 10th Avenue, about four blocks of West Bethlehem. My great-grandmother lived across the street. My grandparents were a block down. Well, My you couldn't go too far, right, up. without somebody knowing what you were yeah. up to? That exactly. Keep, keep you it on the was, straight and, and narrow? You could get, like, lunch at your great-grandmother's. <laughs> you get lunch at your grandmother's, and, yeah, you couldn't drift far away. And I didn't really realize how cool that was until I got older 
and realized that, well, not everybody grows up with their great-grandmother across the street and their grandparents a block down. It's so a neat experience. It was a great way to grow up, but my family was very blue-collar, which is why that kind of arrangement worked in that time period. Everybody either worked for the steel company uh, or they were tradesmen. My family had an electrical contract, still has an electrical contracting business called Westside Electric. Um, so they didn't venture far off of those avenues of West Bethel. Now that since has broken up as the economics have changed sure. and kids have gone to college and you chase jobs and want a bigger house somewhere else. So, but it's, uh, it was a great way to grow up. What kind of kid were you? Describe to me what you were like, like say at when you can first remember <laughs> school, like what kind of student were you? What did, what were you um, into in school? Little, little kid, like seven, eight yeah, years old. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess everybody's an all right student at seven or eight. As I got older, I got less to be <laughs> such a good student. I'd say very active. I still have a hard time sitting still. Was involved in like every sport and every activity and was probably more social and active than studious at that time. I mean, I think. Any the, particular sport? Something you really loved? Well, I grew up playing football and baseball, like really standard kind of American kid, blue collar mm -hmm. town kind of kid stuff, you know. Football, baseball. I ended up running track in high school and college, and uh, but I was just very active to this day. Yeah, keep you, you know, busy, running yeah, around. Yeah, and uh, saw the other side of it as a dad, you know, with active kids and how like you know good, but how crazy it is chasing I'm kids around. I'm in it. I'm in it right and, now. Yeah. It's unbelievable. We're on a and it's harder for like you guys. <laughs> you know, it used to be more like all the stuff happened in your neighborhood. Yeah. You know, now it's, it's all like over. travel teams, Absolutely. weekends away, and. I think, you know, it's great, but it was kind of cool when everybody just played Little League and football up the street. You yeah, know, just now. go out down the block, pick up a few kids. Like my sister's park. kids yeah. are younger, and they go to, like, weekend tournaments, and they're yeah, gone for three days. Yeah, you know? I kind of yeah. wish they just had a little more downtime. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But they're getting better training and coaching and exposure and all well, that. Well, and it's part of the, the hustle part, of college, It is, I guess, it is. Too. It's the deal. Yeah. Um, so any anything that stands out about your family and your upbringing. I mean, that's sort of a unique experience. You didn't realize so you got older that you feel like was an influence for you in your adult life. When now, now you look back a little bit or you see how you parented your children or, you know, that you kind of took from your parents. Was there something special yeah. that stands out? Well, I, don't, I think just that whole sense of family and community, right? So it kind of then permeated into my career was we grew up where – the family was everything, the neighborhood was everything, the community was everything, which probably indirectly, not knowingly, but indirectly led me into what I did for a living, um, that your neighborhood mattered and your city mattered, your community mattered. But I was also, I was, you know, I was born to teenage parents, so my parents were fresh out of high school when I was born. They didn't go to college, and then we lost my mom when we were young, so... You know, I think there was a, more of a sense of urgency, mm. you know. My mom was 33 when she died. And, you know, so that was, in, when I look back on it, mm -hmm. it probably, you know, I ran for mayor when I was 31, and people kind of were like, you're too young for this? And I was like, well, what's too Life young? is short. Life is right, short. Right, that, that like, has such an know, impact on was, you. How old yeah. were you at the time? Ah, uh, 13. Wow, yeah. that's like a really formative 14, time in your life. 13, 14, just turned 14, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so it kind of, it, it you know, things, I think, have an impact on you mm. uh, in your psyche and your approach that you don't realize are having an impact. Absolutely. What yeah. What's your best memory of your mom? Uh, my best, well, my, my mom was a musician. She okay. was a pianist and a violinist, and she was in uh, the district orchestra when she was at Liberty High School. She actually graduated first in her class of a class of a thousand because that what? was before they were yeah oh my gosh that's and, she, quite and an did not go to college you think about that she was first in a class of a thousand kids but didn't go to college instead got married and her husband went yeah, to work in the, the steel times, mills right? and you know, this was yeah. 1964 um so my mom kind of making us learn music and she was very academic and so we always had a piano and an organ in the house, and I learned all my fundamentals of music from my mom, and also learned how to study from my mom. My dad was not a student, and they were like very much the opposites. So well, it's interesting because yeah. I always wonder. We we will we can certainly jump ahead, but yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. Cunningham and Associates. You have a band. Yeah, I've had a you're band. A, you're since, a rock star on the since, side. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> I've had a band. People say, oh, you know, because they think of me as having been in politics and. 
is that a band since junior high school? Like, you know, the music was always my hobby. When did music go passion. from something that you were kind of forced to learn yeah. to something you knew you loved and felt passionate about? Because I know most kids start yeah. the piano lessons and it's like a, ugh, go practice. Correct. I mean, did you have that? And when did it flip? Yeah, I had, well, because my mom said, you have to learn this, you have to know it and learn music, the fundamentals of music, learn it on the piano, 88 keys, the scales. And then I discovered guitar, you know, in, in junior high and high school. And I was like, well, the Which piano is... Which is much cooler. Is, exactly. Like, <laughs> the guitar, you can get chicks. Yeah. You know? The <laughs> piano seemed like, nah. Like, so guitar and rock and roll, uh, junior high, high school, started also to teach myself. Also an awesome myself. time in music. Great like in musical music. history. Yeah. You I were mean, growing up in, like, the one of the yeah, best. Yeah, you know, I was learning, like, that stuff was fresh. Yeah. Late 70s, early 80s, and that music of the 70s decade and the 80s was great if you liked rock, right? And, and the late 60s. So uh, I taught myself guitar and then started playing in garage bands and that type of thing and played music in college. What was your first band? Did you have a name? And who, and who yeah, was in it? Yeah, holy you remember? cow. That's Can you remember funny. that? So I lived, we, we moved out of West Bethlehem. We moved to Bethlehem Township into a neighborhood called Birchwood in Miller Heights. Okay. So the first band I had was a couple kids on the street. We called it the Birchwood Connection. So I forgot all about that. <laughs> I it was love just it. whoever lived on the street, and we were awful, you know, but we made up signs for the band, and uh, then it kind of progressed. I think Thunderbolt was my big band in uh, in high school. I love and, it. Did you have any um, groupies? Uh, Anybody that, like, followed uh, you around or played a tambourine? You know what? <laughs> <laughs> my dad was so cool that, like, we had an unfinished basement, so we were allowed to do the band in the basement. So it was basically like a party every night in I junior high and high How school. So that? there were girls that came. You know, that was the whole reason to play music, really. Can we stop and talk about the beauty of yeah. an unfinished basement? Because nobody has, everybody wants to finish their basements, myself included. But yeah. I had an unfinished basement as a kid, too. Yeah. And we used to, like, roller skate and oh. on the concrete floor. And yeah. I don't know, we just... It was we great. had, you know, we had like some sofas and things. Sure, that it sure. Was, it was, but it was like having we didn't have a, a band though. So now that's a much cooler my basement. My mom was gone by then, so it was like you all of a sudden the mom is usually the kind of the regulator, mm -hmm. keeps the rules in place, keeps a check on everybody. Yeah. Dads are kind of aloof. <laughs> So I like the word regulator. Yeah. I was going to say enforcer, <laughs> enforcer, but I like regulator. I'm going to use that for myself. It's like, like a heavily <laughs> regulated environment when the mom's there. You know, I've seen it then raising kids and their mom like knew everything they were doing and kept track of it. And I was kind of, when they'd sneak out at night, I'd just be asleep and yeah. wouldn't be aware until mm -hmm. now they tell me later. That's but funny. So the downstairs <laughs> just became, for high school kids, became like a place for everybody to hang out. So I thank my dad for, he wasn't a musician, but he allowed all that nonsense to go and on. And what about your sister now? And put she up went with the music? music. My she sister never ended up doing music. She had to learn piano, but then she never never pursued she that. Never pursued okay. the music. So I was doing music a long time, and then it went on the shelf when I was uh, starting my own family, but then it came back. I love it. Yeah. And tell me a little bit about college. Where'd you go to college? How'd you make the decision? What was yeah. the path? Yeah, so it's a funny story. I mean, to first how... of all, to re re say yeah. you, your parents didn't go to college. Correct. So it's always a big thing when you make that first, decision, yeah. first generation changeover. Was it something you, you wanted to do? Was it something your dad encouraged? Was it something that the family sort of thought was unnecessary? What was the take? You know, my dad, so my dad was a steel worker, right? So his grandfather had been a steel worker. His dad was for a little while, but then he became an electrical tradesman, you know, electrician. Uh, and my dad early on said, I want you to go to college, which was sounds like nothing. But at the time, he was one of six. Nobody in the family had ever gone to college. He didn't. His brothers and sisters hadn't gone to college. So it was kind of groundbreaking. And at the time, I remember thinking, why do I have to go to college? You know, you didn't. Yeah. And you're doing fine. And, you know, Grandpa didn't and all that kind of stuff. So my dad was the driver behind it. And it was, I mean, he was right. Um, you know, at that what time. Think, what do you think was the driving force in him telling you that? Did he want, did he, do you think he had a fundamental understanding that maybe it would give you options or he just wanted you to do something he had? I mean, have you ever talked I to him about that? I think the driver was, he didn't want me to do what he did, mm. right? So the part of the steel he worked in was called the Ingot Mold Foundry and they poured molten iron in to make the molds to make the ingots. So it was extremely hot. 
extremely dirty, was extremely dangerous. He used to come home with spark burns all over him because sparks would come up. And they wore protective clothing, but a spark would go down under the mm. neck, and he'd have pock marks. And he just didn't want me to do what he did. And maybe he never said this to me, but maybe he thought I had the ability to do something more. Um, but I can remember from a young age, he said, you're going to go to college. And then I actually never took it very seriously. Mm. It got to, like, junior year and I always am kind of amazed now when people go on like 15 college visits and everything so so here's how it worked in my house um my dad said you're going to go to college which at some point I thought oh okay well I get to pick where I'm going to go and uh you know I'm a young Irish Catholic boy and I thought well LaSalle College in Philadelphia would be great so I applied to LaSalle for some reason I was attracted to LaSalle I got admitted um my dad looked at like what it cost and he said, you're not going to LaSalle. And Ooh. he said, I can't afford LaSalle. Yeah. So uh, a guy, a buddy of his at the steel mill had a kid who went to Shippensburg. And he said, go to that place because I can afford that place. So I applied to Shippensburg, never saw it, never went, didn't go to a visit, got accepted. And uh, showed up on my first day at Shippensburg was the first time I saw <laughs> oh it. Oh, my gosh. The so, day you moved in? I think there was like an orientation. Okay, Maybe something. like Maybe like a 10 days before some you went I there. love that your dad knew and he wanted you to college, knew the, you know you need to consider the cost, but basically that was about it. It was just like, so... And, you know, and by it, the way, that's refreshing because well, as someone who's about to embark on that whole journey, I, I, I think people totally become nuts, now, though. We become right? a little yeah, nuts. So there's something to be said because what, what happens? You go there. It works out. You yeah, like it? Yeah, You're fine? Time. Yeah, I mean, the first couple of years, I was like, what am I doing here? And, you know, but they got beer and they got girls and it seems cool. You yeah, know? I'll stay. Yeah. <laughs> you know. This isn't a terrible but, way to yeah, spend my yeah, time. Yeah, right, right. But it was a little later that I got caught on <laughs> into the academics. But, uh, you know, in my family, it was like a very long tradition of if your dad said it, you just that you mm. just, it's just what had happened, you know. So he said, okay, you're not going there, you're going here. So you just went. And then funny for my sister, she's two years younger than me. She didn't even have a choice. He said to her, you're going to Shippensburg. Donnie's there. It's good. I can afford it. He can drive you back and forth and watch over you. And you're going to Shippensburg. Not so amazing. So neither one of us had a choice. <laughs> and some guy who we worked with whose kid went to Shippensburg was the whole reason that, you Isn't know, that we, incredible? we went there. Yeah, yeah so funny how life works out. very different now. Now, when you get yeah. there and you're sort of mm -hmm. figuring it out, now you're faced with this whole choice of what do I do, right? What do I major yeah. in? What does that all yeah. mean? How did you, what did you major in and what... Yeah, well, you, you know, that, that was kind of easier. That was strange because I was a journalism major and a, and a government minor. And uh, early on in high school, uh, I, I loved to write, and I had a talent for it. And in high school, at Free, I went to Freedom High School in Bethlehem. I was on the uh, the high school newspaper, and it was called the Freedom Forum. Okay. And I'd write about anything. You know, I'd cover sports that I didn't play in and... I ended up with a with a like a record review column, and I really liked to write. So, and I had a I think in my junior year I had a journalism class, which was really cool. I was an elective in the English uh, tract, and I really liked it and was good at it. So I, I, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to write, um, and so I got a journalism degree. What was your dad's take on writing? I mean, that had to be a fairly foreign concept that that was like a yeah. career. That's like I want to be an artist or, yeah. you know. And it took, you yeah, know, it I mean, you're t it's so funny because you're touching on something. So as much as my old man wanted me to go to school, he want, didn't want me to change, right? So we all know that, like, once you open your mind and you expose yourself to knowledge and, uh, you know, uh, attaining different skills, and then you have well, different thoughts. The world opens up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everything else. So there was a period of time where, uh, towards the end of college, graduate school, where my dad and I were like, he was like, what did I create here? You know, I had all these different <laughs> thoughts. And, uh, yeah, he didn't really get the academic side and, you know, this kind of opening up of knowledge and... Uh, learning that uh, transforms a person. Yeah. So it transformed me a bit, you know, and uh, and I evolved a little bit. And it took a little bit till we kind of could sync up that. I mean, never really like a huge Yeah, but still chasm, an adjustment, I can imagine. And like, you've lived yeah. in this small radius, yeah. right? Oh, I mean, yeah. I love, Exposed as, to as someone very who's, little. who's been here for mm. 15 years, 
and I always think of it as the Lehigh Valley, mm -hmm. I still always pick up on when someone says, well, I moved from the west side to Bethlehem Township. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you yeah, guys, yeah. you say that as if you moved from, big. you know, Harrisburg to huge. Philadelphia. And because we left the neighborhood. Right. You know, my so, dad was like, he, he built, my dad and mom built this little tiny ranch house in Bethlehem Township. And it was, it was probably, it's probably five miles. But it was like Might we as well left, been another, we left yeah. the neighborhood behind. It was probably like in the old days when someone would leave, you know, the Lower East Side to go out to Long Island. And right. It was like you left the city and now you're out in the suburbs. And right. it was for Bethlehem that was that was it was that kind of experience. But yeah, my I I was never outside of Pennsylvania other than to go to the Jersey Shore one week of the summer until I was twenty years old. Wow. So yeah. And then where'd you go? At 20. The first place I ever went, a buddy of mine had some friends who had moved to Phoenix, Arizona. for So for spring break, he and I flew to Phoenix to uh, camp in the desert and hike during spring break and visit his friends. So I got on a plane and landed in the desert in Arizona. It was my first plane flight and first place outside of Pennsylvania, New Jersey. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah, and I still. Do you remember what it was like when you? Yeah, just I do remember. Out there? I remember being a little scared on the plane, and then I just remembered, like, all of a sudden seeing this completely different landscape and the southwest of America and deserts, mm -hmm. and it was like I landed on the moon. Yeah, you know? totally different. Yeah, and that was the only spring break I ever did. You know, I nope. didn't do the. My dad would never have paid for or allowed for like the Fort Lauderdale. Back when I sure. was young, people went to Fort Lauderdale and Daytona. And, yeah. Well, now they probably go to like Mexico or something. Well, true. Yeah, yeah. Or Europe. <laughs> yeah, or yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what what kind of jobs did you have when you were in high school? What was your first job or what were some yeah. of the jobs? You had anything recognizable we'd still know? Yeah, well, I delivered, uh, they probably don't do this anymore, but I delivered newspapers, mm -hmm. you know, the whole way through from seventh grade to senior year. I now, you know, my a, brother had a paper route, but paper when he route. couldn't do it, and it was on bike. You had to do it. My sister That's and I, I used to do it. it. On bike. It was great. I thought yeah. it was good fun, but I didn't have to do it all the time. Right, I was, right, I was right. a sub, so. <laughs> yeah, I did paper route for six years and earned all my kind of spending money in high school doing that. I worked at a pizza shop, but I played sports, so. I didn't have a lot of time for like after school jobs because mm -hmm. I played football, ran track, played baseball. So uh, it was in the morning, get up at four o'clock in the morning, deliver the papers and then come back. And then, you know, it was interesting because my mom was gone and my dad would leave for the steel mills at like four in the morning. So my job was to make sure that my sister and I were up and got breakfast and got to the bus. And then once I was 16 and could drive, I drove us both to school. That's great. Yeah. Think so, about that level of responsibility though. That mm -hmm. is often lost, and kind yeah, of what you difference. really took from that. I mean, that was just your life, so you did it. Yeah. But at, you know, you start raising your own kids, and you, you start getting to be an adult. Yeah, and you look back and sort of think, "Wow, that's pretty my, my responsible." Dad was really good at, like, you know, in a very nice way because he's a wonderful guy, and he was never mean. But he ruled, he maintained order, and we had to be responsible for our own stuff. I probably didn't do as good a job as a dad, and in. in translating all of that I lost I did not have the authority that my father I know it's, it, it's, it, it, it gets lost a little bit each, yeah, each generation yeah. I think unfortunately yeah, yeah. now what about college did you have any summer jobs or internships at what point do you start thinking about what the next steps are yeah I always worked I mean it, you know the idea of internships was foreign I mean I'd come home in the summer and I worked construction two years. I worked framing houses and one year as a landscaper and one year installing flooring, carpeting, and hardwood floors and tile. And it was the construction trades, you know. My That's dad, pretty handy to have it, to learn all those things on a summer job. Yeah, my dad. Well, my dad was always building things and fixing. The house. Yeah, he did everything himself. I mean, I grew up in the world where you never hired a guy to do it. You, like, you, you did, did it. it yourself. Yeah. You know, if you were going to fix up the basement, my dad framed the walls and put in the carpeting. And he had a side business installing flooring. So from the time I was a kid, I would go out with him on jobs. So he would make extra money that okay. way. Of course, like I haven't done any of that since then because then once... I got into professional work. I didn't have time to keep up on. Like, well, the, listen, the trades. I I'm, I, yeah. I want to make sure Lynn yeah. realizes though that you have these capabilities somewhere. <laughs> they're there. Your they're buried set, down. In case you want yeah. to retile a bathroom or something. Yeah, you know, my I, I will tell you that my first uh, real like kind of harrowing experience with the trades and construction. So it was my second summer framing houses, and there were a lot of new houses starting to go up in the '80s. 
as the first wave of Jersey started to move into the Lehigh Valley and the, the, the suburbs started to grow, and we'd frame houses. And one summer, I was up on the we were on the third floor putting the the the, the, um, uh, the rafters up. And they were coming up in trusses. So they were prefab trusses, and we were pulling them up. And I was up on the top, and the last truss got caught. And it went, and there were three of us on ladders and three of us on the roof, and all six of us tumbled uh, down. Wow. And one guy landed and snapped off two of his fingers. Oh. And I went down, and I saw, you know, I was able to, fortunately, I wasn't injured, but uh, it made me realize, like, I don't want to do this for a living. Yeah. And, and I think that it transformed me a little bit to say okay you know let me take school a little more seriously and what I'm going to do professionally and and I was like man this stuff can be very dangerous interesting that you mm. can pinpoint it to that exact experience when I look it back been really yeah. yeah I left the framing crew and I, at that time then I went to work doing flooring because I thought well flooring's a little safer I always find it yeah. interesting <laughs> to see that what your parents do can have such an influence one way or the other. So my husband's also, his parents did not go to college and, mm-hmm. um, you know, first to go to college. And, and one of the reasons he went into medicine was because, um, you know, his dad is very successful in the printing business, but he basically said, go do something stable, get stability. Yeah. You know, running yeah. in your own business is, is a little wild, which now, of right. course, he gets to experience through me. But right, right. it's amazing how that or, you know, where your parents' perspective was, and I think about that experience with the construction, yeah. and your dad just probably knew that what he did every day, not only was it, you know, labor, hard labor, but yeah. dangerous. It was and dangerous. he didn't want that for his, his kid. It was dangerous. So I what, mean, you, what happens when you get out of school? What's your first job? Do you go right to grad school, or did you work? I worked. Uh, I got a job right away. I mean, all through college, I wrote and wrote and wrote. Mm-hmm. I wrote um, while I was at Shippensburg. I wrote for the paper in Carlisle. I wrote for the paper in Chambersburg, the paper in Shippensburg. Plus, I wrote for the student newspaper. Oh, so wow. uh, now, when I came home in the summer, it was all construction, earn money, because my dad said you you know got to earn money. I wasn't interning, but in, during school, I was just working all the time. Uh, so I came out with, and as you know, I mean, writing is a very, you can only teach so much. You have to do it and do it and do it. And newspaper reporting and journalism, there's probably five or six classes you need to take, you know, whether it's ethics or com law or basic, you know, reporting skills. Beyond that, it's just doing the trade and doing it over and over. So uh, I came out with a pretty thick clipbook, so I did get hired right away. And I went to work for a chain of... Uh, weekly papers in suburban Philadelphia, which was based out of uh, Hatboro, Willow Grove, Horsham area, Montgomery County, Philadelphia suburb. That's pretty great. Um, now, do you remember uh, any of your first? I mean, first of all, it is—it's a big accomplishment. I mean, I, you mm-hmm. know, I think that coming out of school with a degree to get a field in your—you know—to get a job in your field. Even today, yeah, it's exciting. So it was probably easier than I mean. Now journalism, as we know, is completely different. I mean, everything. This was pre-internet. Sure, this sure. Is, no, everything was print-based, and uh, you know there were more jobs than there are today for writers. That first month or so, writing yeah. down up for a Philly paper, you're out yeah. of school. Anything that that stood out? Any stories or first experiences in that first job, or anything you took with yeah. you? I mean, the two things I would say, and one in general is, as every new reporter, you get thrown into municipal government, right, going to the <laughs> night meetings. But I did, that was my first exposure to the government, local government process. And while I don't remember any one specific thing, it had an effect. I liked it. You know, it was like people would say, oh, I got to go to the night meeting. I'm like, this is fascinating to me. You know, I'd go down to Lower Moreland Township and they'd be talking about the development project and the drainage swales. And I was like, I found myself really interested in the machinations of how that came together. But I also loved like profile feature writing. And I remember the the one story that because I've since had contact with the editor I worked for in, in later years after I was long gone. But she sent me out to do a profile on a guy who was turning 100. And he lived in a nursing home down there in, in Willow Grove. And I went and I came back and I must have filed. They used to uh, measure story lengths in column inches. Now they do it in words. But I, I filed like a 40 column inch profile on this guy who could hardly talk. And she said, I don't know how you could go out, interview a guy who said like five sentences and come back and file 40 inches. I said, well, I talked to the family and I did it like a thing about his whole life. And I was, I liked the uh, 
talking to people yeah. and profiling people and their stories and their lives were in. So, you know, I came to this conclusion that everybody's got a story. Like everybody's interesting in some way. And That's, that uh, is yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly what I loved about this field. Exactly yeah. what, what resonated with me in high school and college was just this concept that, you mean I could do a job where I just get to talk to people yes. about their lives? And my, my mother always says it's a great job for a nosy kid who asked a lot of questions. And it really is the truth. Yeah. But, well, um, you're very good at oh, it. Oh, thanks. So you are. you. I really, yeah. It's just interesting. I think that everybody has something in their lives and their, their experience that they can yeah. lend to someone everybody else. Everybody does. And they really do. And, and people discount that sometimes. And everybody's favorite subject is themselves. Right. Well, <laughs> it's easy to talk about yourself. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. So yeah. you progress through your career. When do you decide to go back to grad school and why? I, I kind of knew as soon as I became a reporter. At that time, I wanted to be, you know, uh, Bob Woodward, Carl Bernstein. I think every young reporter wanted to be an investigative reporter and do research. And uh, and I thought the uh, best pathway to advance myself in journalism was to become a specialist in something. So uh, not long after, I went to Villanova for uh, graduate school in political science. Not because I wanted to be a practitioner of government, because I wanted to cover and write about government. Okay, so to learn a little bit more. But yeah. it's interesting that you really were struck by that, you know, those municipality-type meetings, because, again, yeah. it is sort of the thing in journalism. That everybody Everybody hates. rolls their eyes. Yeah. And so, yeah. but, I, I liked how it, you know, when I look back on it, it was I, I was interested in how it all came together. Yeah. I yeah. like that, too. I think that one of the things that's neat about... Um, being a journalist is, is you do get to see behind the curtain of a yeah. lot of things and the way things work. Yeah. And as somebody who had used your hands and built things and, and learned, it's sort of the building blocks of our society in a lot of ways. Yeah, and I was curious and I was learning. I mean, I kind of led a sheltered life. I mean, look, I didn't leave the, barely <laughs> left the state till I was graduating college. So, it, like, worlds were opening up. I don't want to fast forward too much, because yeah. I'm sure a lot happened in between. Yeah. Um, but we should mention, of course, that you, you were the mayor of Bethlehem. Yeah. So how do we go from a journalist, you get your grad school degree, you're mm -hmm. poli sci, you're sort of interested in government, mm -hmm. you're writing about government. When does that come into play? It's not that many years later, right? I mean, you're in your 30s. Correct, and Yeah, I mean, I, um, so when I was in graduate school at Villanova, I took a job with the Philadelphia Inquirer. I left the weekly paper. I was fortunate that they hired me to write in the Suburban Bureau. So I was writing in the Montgomery County Suburban Bureau, the Philadelphia Inquirer, finished graduate school at Villanova, and much like my parents, I mean, I got married, you know, for them, they got married right out of high school. I got married right out of college. Uh, I met my future wife at Shippensburg. Okay. We dated two years, and, you know, the, the process I knew was, okay, you date, you get done with school, and you get married. So I got married, and... While I was in graduate school, my first child, so I was 24, married with a child, right? So I got married at 22. Bridget, my daughter, was born at, I was 24. Uh, finished graduate school, and my career was journalism. So, and I, you know, I had an opportunity to come back home. The Bethlehem Globe Times, which doesn't exist anymore, which was the family-owned weekly daily paper in Bethlehem, uh, was hiring reporters. And I thought, well, this is cool. I can go back to Bethlehem. And so I came back here, and this is the setup because then when I came back, of course, they throw you in the local government, right? So <laughs> I was covering Bethlehem city government, government in, around the area, uh, and then I also ended up covering business. I ended up covering the steel industry. So I kind of got thrown right into... At a pretty pivotal time in the steel industry, right? Am correct. I, I mean, correct things there? were okay. going down and, and, you know, the beginnings of the end were taking place with Bethlehem Steel and trying to save it with the Be British Steel deal, which didn't go through. And I was in the midst of covering all that. So all of a sudden now I'm immersed in what's actually going on in my own home city. Uh, and I got a front row seat to see the people who were governing the city. And, you know, I kind of came to the conclusion of two things. They were great folks, but they were out of touch with what was occurring. I felt my brash young version of sure. myself was, wow, you know, these are just regular people who go to these meetings and who are on the city council. And then I'm a, like what today would be the millennial, I'm the millennial of my era thinking, these guys, you know, don't really get 
what's going on for 20 year olds with young kids Mm -hmm. because most of them are 60 and 70 and they've been on the council for 30 years so uh, I end up leaving journalism I get a job at Moravian College as their director of media and marketing and then I get recruited to go to PPL in the corporate office so at that time I'm in corporate communications in the headquarters at PPL and uh, I decided to run for city council which is part time, and you know, because now I'm not in journalism, I can run. So, literally, I had the idea of running and running within about a year's time. People say, Did you always know you wanted to run? I'm like, No, not at all. I wanted to cover it, I wanted to write about it, I wanted to understand it. And then it was really what was happening in Bethlehem that uh, it was tremendous change that was, uh, that was coming. And uh, for some reason, I felt compelled to get involved myself so I walked around and knocked on doors and ran for city council which was you know I'd had nobody in my family had been in politics I didn't know anybody in politics I didn't have the support of anybody in (laughs) politics I just you know was of the city and had thoughts about where we needed to go and and got myself elected to the city council when you think about that decision, and, I, and it probably wasn't, was you know, conscious 20, at the time. Uh, 29, 28 or right, 29. you've got little kids. Yeah. yeah. Um, you're pretty young. Yeah. Had, you think about that. What do you think was the characteristic in yourself that led you to believe that this was something you could do? You know, I think um, there was a couple things when you asked that question. One was... I probably had my dad's confidence and self-assuredness, right? That um, I was confident in my own viewpoints. Uh, And then I think, you know, like my mom dying young just felt like you can't waste time. You know, it was like, you you know, you just don't don't let age be a hurdle, just do it. And, you know, I, I think I had some good ideas because at that time it was a totally different city. It was not the Bethlehem you know today. There were no restaurants. Downtown closed at 430. And um, there were a lot of vacant spots around the city. The South Side had nothing going on. And, um, you know, I had been to Johnstown. I You know, I'd been to Lackawanna and I'd seen what happened after the mills closed there, because those were Bethlehem Mm -hmm. mills that closed before the home plant mill. And I was just like, I don't want my kid, you know, we we gotta do something to change this. You know, we we can reinvent, but we gotta let go of yesterday and focus on the future. It was that simple, and I had some specific ideas and talked to people about it, and it resonated. It's amazing. So you go from city council to a run for the mayor. Yeah, the- well, you know, what I quickly found on, on a, in a strong mayor form of government where the mayor's full-time and runs the whole administration and city council's part-time and shows up for two meetings a month is if you're on the city council, you're one of seven. And then I was a bit ostracized because I was a young, not by party. I mean, they were pretty much all Democrats. I think there might have been two Republicans on the city council back then. Uh, but I was definitely an outlier. The older guys didn't like me mm. much, and so I couldn't do anything on council. I was like, hey, sit there, kid. Okay, kid, <laughs> you want a seat? Great for you. Don't now we're talk. Gonna, now we're going to show you how the world really works, right? <laughs> so I was like, well, all right, if you guys are going to like put me in the corner, then I'm just going to run for mayor like an idiot. And I was 31, and... Did the same thing. Went around, walked around the neighborhoods, you know, printed up Did people up flyers expect that you would and, lose? I yeah, mean, yeah. Everybody did, yeah. How did it feel when you won? I mean, honestly, in that moment. Yeah, I mean, I will tell you Were you, you excited? That, Were you scared? Uh, no, Were I was you... excited. I was scared. But, you know, one thing that we had done, and I had a bunch of other young guys, and actually some of the older guys, some of the old steel workers who were my dad's friends, we had this strange coalition of non-political people who kind of one saw that the city needed to evolve and change right and um we went through a long process of saying exactly what we wanted to do now, well here's what's going to happen the steel is going to close we know that's going to occur here's how we need to redevelop the land we spent so much time on the ideas part of it and the program that when i did win it was like okay now we just work the plan you know and it was that naivete though of you don't, know, you don't know what you don't know mm-hmm. when you're 31. The advantage is you don't know what you're throwing yourself into and how hard it's actually going to be. sort of be. nice, though. It's a little but, of that ignorance is bliss yeah. because you yeah. just forge ahead. You only get to be ignorant have, a couple times yeah. in your life, and it's kind of 
wonderful. Yeah, you know? <laughs> but, agreed. But um, I wasn't nervous because I felt like I'd spent three years talking about what was going to occur and what we needed to do. Preparing. 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 So I felt like I had a plan. Tell me what you are most proud of as a mayor and also what the best lesson is that you learned. Well, what I'm most proud of is, you know, and, and obviously, look, things happen through lots of people, the business community, the education community, the neighborhoods, but it was a pivotal time. And the steel closed my third month in office. We didn't have downtowns to speak of. And what we did, I think, changed the city. It put it on a different course. Those things don't just naturally happen. It takes some leadership, and then leadership that brings everybody in to say, we can do this. And when I drive down a street, and look, this is a city I was born and raised in, my parents were born and raised in, my kids, and it's a desirable place, you know? People want to move here. They want to come here. When I drive down Main Street at night and I see all these people going from, I'm like, yeah, I I did that restaurant project or we put that building there. We played a role in it. I mean, that's an amazing feeling. It's just a little place, a little pinpoint on a map of the world. But playing a role, playing a role in that is, is, that's what I remember the most. The second question was, what was the greatest lesson you learned in being mayor? a life lesson a life lesson was you know and it probably was that you can have ideas alone but you can't execute anything alone and it sounds simple but you know I hear people today in politics and they have we live in this ideological era where everybody's got these philosophical thoughts be they far left or be they far right the art of the possible you know was at local government level it wasn't about philosophy it wasn't about ideology it was about bringing together as many people as you could to make what was possible happen it was i learned pragmatism and i learned that uh results come in moderation when you bring people together in the center and the thing i hate about american politics today is everybody's fighting for these grand philosophical, extremes, ideological extremes. extremes. We come to the middle, and the, rea- yeah, the reality yeah. is success and things happen in the middle when you can bring people together around an idea. So that idea has to be practical because it has to appeal to a multitude of people, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, that, and, and that's partly why I'm out of politics today is that, you know, I, I don't think you can be a practitioner of government anymore. You're just a philosophical debater trying to get a win for your team. And, and you know, that wasn't my Interestingly, experience. Interestingly, though, you, you know, to come full circles, we started talking about yeah. LVEDC. You're now in a role where, in a lot of ways, you're just doing exactly that. You're just bringing exactly. people together. I don't want to say just because it's, it's a monstrous yeah. task, but you have a huge team. Um, it's, you, you know, know it's, it's incredible it's great work. Because, you know, I would say, well, people have asked me, well, what makes a successful mayor? It's really like just being like an orchestra conductor. If you can, you have an orchestra and you have your brass and your percussion and your woodwinds and you want to get everybody kind of playing off the same sheet of music. And if you can do that, it's going to sound really good. If everybody's off on their own, it's going to sound horrible, right? right? So, (laughs) and it's a little the same with LVDC. I mean, our job is to find a pathway to get things done. You know, whether we're working with the local government on zoning and planning or working with the state government to try to get access to capital for a project that we know is good for the region, um, well, you've kind of got to try and to... And working everything from everything. the workforce, yeah. the, workforce, the uh, yeah. educational yeah. system and what's in place for people to support that workforce is pretty... Yeah. It's cool. You guys are a little bit the hub of the wheel and the growth it's in this cool. area has been incredible. It's really good to be in the middle of it and, and when times are good and things are rolling, it's really fun. I mean, I always tell the folks that are younger than me at my office... You know, I spent a lot of time when, in Bethlehem in the beginning, we were excited if a CVS was coming in or a Perkins was coming in. Uh, we never envisioned the days of, you know, bringing a company with 800 employees or, you know, a new. It's it's changed, and I'm always afraid that, you know, okay, what's around the corner? We're going to go back to the days where we're scraping and crawling. I mean, I was trying to get developers interested in Bethlehem in the late 90s, 
that nobody wanted to develop in the cities. And it's only 20 years forward, and everybody's fighting over land now. Everybody's trying to get a parcel of land because everybody wants to do a project on the city, which is great. And it's changing, great, like, weekly. I mean, you can go downtown, and, and especially the south side right now is just incredible. Well, I yeah. don't want to let you go before we talk a little yeah. bit about your family. So yeah. tell me about your beautiful wife, Lynn, yeah, yeah, who just yeah. retired from the chamber. She was just a major leader in the chamber for the last, what, 13 years or 15 yeah, years? Yeah, yeah. Like I mean, Lynn, if, if people know Lynn, uh, Lynn Collins Cunningham, she's an amazing dynamo of a person. Uh, I We've been fortunate because we've done basically the same type of work. Uh, she's, you know, she's worked at the parking authority. She went on to the chamber, and she's also born and raised in Bethlehem from a family of seven people, lives and breathes Bethlehem. Same for me. So our passions and our work have lined up, and she's really cool and funny. The, the collective and, and energy and between the two of you yeah, is unbelievable. Yeah. I really, I mean, both yeah. of you light up a room. Both of you are the type of people yeah. that when everybody sees you, you derive energy from you guys. So what do you think is sort of the secret to your happiness and your marriage? You've got well, four kids between you. Yeah, and, and look, second I mean, marriage I've been, I've for been both. really lucky because yeah. I, I say like I've I've been married to two great women, you know, and 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 my first marriage to Laura, who's still here in Bethlehem and does a lot of work, and I've had a great relationship with her since you know we the, the day we we split apart, and we talk you know every couple days because we have kids together and it's still she's still part of the family. I love to hear you that know? because I yeah. have parents that are divorced like that yeah. and. Um, you know, it's just such a great thing for the kids and eventually for grandkids and everything else. It's such a nice thing when people can kind of it is. It, work out their differences and live their lives. So it's nice it's to managed, hear. It's, it's managed to work and, you know, but Lynn I met later in life when, you know, Laura and I met at 19 and we're married by 22. So you don't really know who you are and what you're going to become and what your interests and passions really are because you're in that same spot of college where everybody's the same. Uh, but... Lynn and I meeting later, we met around like our shared passions and viewpoint and love of Bethlehem and family and community. And we kind of came from the same, I mean, we literally grew up like a mile from each other. We didn't know each other, but we grew up a mile from each other. So there was just this kind of synergy and energy around. Kind of cool to same. both be yeah. moving the, the needle in the area together and yet with different entities in different ways but it's interesting how you've kind of had this synergy um, yeah. of impact in the area this yeah. i don't know if you look at it that way but i think as outsiders you know looking in and lucky enough to know you both that's sort of how it seems well, so I it's mean, cool it's, it's just been our lives and i always say to people like you know um i just never left i'm a homer you know like i don't have great international experiences you know i've never been wealthy never will be wealthy uh but i feel like where it all started was family, neighborhood, community, and for better or worse, you know, both she and I have just never left here, and we still love the community and the city and, and family. And, and what about your kids? And the, the kids are, are great. They're now, uh, as I said at the outset, I'm, you know, working to get them back. So <laughs> uh, my three kids, my, my oldest is 28, my daughter Bridget's a school teacher in Philadelphia. She went to Temple University, stayed in Philadelphia, got married, and uh, but is home a lot on the weekends because it's Philadelphia. Uh, my middle son, Shane, uh, he's uh, digital in, in digital communications with Cigars International. He's the one that's here at home. Okay. So he has an apartment right now in Whitehall. My youngest son, Brendan, is um, a product designer with Ralph Lauren in New York City. He went to Parsons School of Design, and he designs lighting fixtures in the home goods section wow. in New York. But again, New York being close, so great. We go up there. He comes home. Uh, and my stepson, Nate, uh, Lynn's son, is in, uh, farther away. He's on the West Coast in L.A. He was a theater major Well, it's at, nice to have one Temple. kid to go visit somewhere yeah. cool. Yeah, <laughs> so we're actually going out to visit him in May. Uh, but, you know, they're all doing well. Uh, only one of them's married. So the next, our next hope in life is, you know, grandkids and hopefully getting more of those millennials coming back to the Lehigh Valley. All right. Well, ASR yeah. is doing our part. We <laughs> try to keep them are. here and they love you it are. and they bring significant yeah. others. And yeah. I was telling yeah. you, it's just a lot of fun yeah. uh, to be surrounded by these young people every day. Yeah. But before you go, I'm going to ask you a quick little fire round of questions. Sure. We didn't yeah, prep yeah. for this. People should no, know. We didn't prep you don't for know. Any of this, nope. It just, yeah, just yeah, did yeah. it. Yeah. All right. If you could travel anywhere in the world, where would it be? That I've been or not nope, been? Nope, not been. Not been? 
Uh, not been, not been. Where do, where would I want to go that I haven't been? Um, Lynn, get your pen and paper out. Uh, the western part of the United States, Montana, Wyoming, Big Sky Country. Okay, see some big now, parks, national the, parks. I haven't been to the western part the, of the U.S. I have been to some of those places, but I haven't done like a national parks type trip, and it's on our bucket list. Want so to do it. Yeah, yeah, that sounds yeah. cool. If you could have dinner with anybody in the world, who would it be? Living or dead? Either. You can pick a few people if you want. Uh, well, my love of music. I mean, I'd love to have dinner with Bruce Springsteen, uh, maybe Mick Jagger. I feel Keith like that. Richards. I feel like those are things that could happen. Still, <laughs> yeah. is anyone listening? Yeah, I'm hoping. You know, Tag Bruce Springsteen, Mick Let's Jagger, see what Keith Richards. Uh, you know, funny politics. I mean, I, I don't want to sound immodest, but like I've met a lot of the national political figures. So while I might not have had dinner one-on-one -on -one with them, I've been in the White them. House with presidents and, and that type of thing. So, uh, I mean, dead, uh, my hero of heroes was Abraham Lincoln. If somehow through some uh, telepathy I could talk to Abraham Lincoln, I'd love to do that. If you could have one final meal, what would that meal be? What is the, your favorite, absolute favorite thing to eat? Wow. This is like a death row thing. A little bit, last yeah, meal. yeah. It's a hard, it's a hard <laughs> one, right? Well, I, you know, first thing that pops into my head is pretty much anything Lynn cooks. Lynn is an unbelievable cook, and I'm so happy when we can eat at home and not go to a restaurant. Isn't that nice? Just to have it's that true. time. It's yeah. amazing how as you get it only older, happens too, about you appreciate two, two nights out of the week, but. Uh, when she has time to cook and, and we don't have somewhere we have to be, um, that's the best. Home well, I real. think that is the perfect ending because yeah. it all goes back to home for you. I think yeah. it started here. Uh, you know, clearly you've got this wonderful home uh, and place here yeah. with your wife and, and kids and yeah. life now. So I'm we're so guy. we're so grateful for all that you do for this community, Don. And the LVD EDC does so much great work, and the growth is incredible. It's really been fun to well, watch thanks. and uh, fun to make my home and life here yeah, too. Thanks. So thank you. I've been lucky the jobs I've had and the career. So Good. Well, thanks for being here, Don. Thank you guys for listening. This is Unscripted with Russo.